who I work with and, and so on, and, and, and I remind them that uh, we're, I want well, to say, you know, we're, we're one experiment away. <laughs> now, of course, Edison was one experiment away from the light bulb for how many experiments? So, so, uh, so we have, you know, uh, it would help, it would help immensely if we had a theory that, that we could use, that we could uh, try and design our experiments to accommodate uh, that theory. You know, for example, one of the things is um, muon catalyzed fusion, you know, can we create a heavy electron? Can we create uh, is there something we can do to produce those uh, that and and because we believe that is one of the things that stimulates the production or, or the events I've recently come to the conclusion that we really don't need uh, at this point we're not looking for ways to trigger the reaction we're looking for ways to sustain the reaction and, and when you think about the IR camera you know there were hundreds of reactions that were occurring you know several per second uh, but for some reason they didn't sustain and and uh, you know we're in a, a situation where the palladium lattice is in fact the, the reaction chamber if you will uh, the heat from one reaction is going to obviously uh, disrupt the lattice so so whatever the properties of the lattice were that caused or allowed that to event to happen uh, have probably now been uh, blown apart until be reestablished. So, um, the the straight answer, the short answer to your question, no, we don't have enough at this point. Well, I, you know, we've solved the tough problems. You know, we're we're violating the laws of physics here, producing these neutrons. So, <laughs> so you would think we we've done the tough part, but uh, we do need to do more work to get and, and and scaling is something that we haven't focused on. So we're just beginning to focus on that now. Where are you getting your funding? DOE DOE's not funding. Yeah, you know, I when I was department head for the Navy, I had you know a budget of close to three hundred million a year, and so I could could had some discretionary money that I could use. Um, I retired a year ago, and and uh, basically I'm like most of you, I'm working uh, for sweat equity. You know, when this, when this, when this works, I might, I'm going to really be made, have made a lot of money per hour. For that. Um, but we do have uh, Dr. Kim uh, from uh, JWK uh, is putting a lot of his personal money into it to uh, to try and get this going. He's also uh, we're trying to get funding from uh, you know DOE and, and others. As it turns out, uh, we've got more foreign interest in funding us than than we do uh, from the U.S. Sad as that is may seem, uh, that's the reality. Yes. From the mainstream uh, uh, sense, uh, it is believed that the cold fusion is not possible for tourism uh, because they uh, they think it is needed very high, uh, very high temperature is needed, and there is not uh, always uh, evidence of neutrons. Uh, but uh, from theoretical point of view, I speak from my theory. I don't like to impose to because it's difficult to. <laughs> To show that you have a theory that is 10 years old without uh, the supernova, I clearly see that alpha decay, for example, in lanthanid, uh, appears like a fusion because the protons that are not uh, like per atomic model, but they are extended object, they are properly oriented and in some kind of uh, shape, uh, some instability process, process of uh, this uh, radioactive elements, they're just properly oriented and they get to a fusion and disappears at room temperature. And the, in fact, the alpha particles, it is, uh, it is just a uh, helium to the neutrons, to helium, it is a, uh, it is a cold fusion. So uh, I see theoretically that this is possible. Well, I see experimentally that it's happening. So I, 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 yeah. Yes. Um, the thing I was waiting for you to, um, waiting to hear from you is that you'd um, gotten a big cooler, uh, a big, you know, foam box, and made a calorimeter and counted the electrical energy going in and the and the rays and temperature and and then normalized that by by testing it with the same temperature so you knew how much you were losing. Mm -hmm. 
too. So, okay. so that's yeah. my question. Let, let, me, let me address that. If Michael <laughs> Kubri would have given this talk, that's what he would have talked about. Uh, uh, Mel Miles, Charlie Lake, that's what he is doing. There are a lot of people doing that. We came to the conclusion, right or wrong, several years ago that 30% that access, he wasn't going to convince anybody, uh, particularly not you know DOE. We, at the time, can assumed that if we could produce high energy nuclear particles, that would convince people. Uh, what we have discovered is that the bar is continually being raised. <laughs> Most people think that in 1989, when the, the ERAB, which was the Energy Research Advisory Board, what, what DOE set up to evaluate the initial claims, that they put a stake in coal fusion and said it, it doesn't work. That's not what it said. What their report concluded was that there is not enough information to either say yes, this is real, or no, it is not real at this time, and more research is needed. In 2004, a team of people went to DOE and they presented heat data, and they had DOE had 16 independent reviewers, and about half of those reviewers uh, said, you know, there's something going on here, uh, and, and the other half said, well, we're not sure. In fact, it was almost a bell curve. You know, there were <laughs> one or two people on one end saying, this is absolutely nuclear, this is something we've got to do. Uh, on the other end, there were one or two that said, I don't see anything here, I'm, I'm disappointed they haven't uh, made more progress in, in 20, 18 years, although, you know, without any funding, they left that part out. Um, but when we've briefed them, uh, you know, it used to be, I felt that we thought if we could convince them it was nuclear, that that would be sufficient for them to say, we need to learn what's going on here. Uh, the last one we went and talked to him, uh, one of the individuals said, so you can produce neutrons. Uh, we know how to produce neutrons. Why should we invest more money <laughs> in this approach? <laughs> <laughs> My answer to that was, um, well, we know how much energy it takes for you to produce your own energy. <laughs> uh, we know that we're producing neutrons by a technique that is not predicted by your theory. Those two things alone should be sufficient for reason to do this. Now the other thing is the Defense Intelligence Agency did a, a report that ended up being unclassified, came out last, I think, November 11th, uh, that said here's what's happening in the world because uh, in some parts of the world, the governments there have gotten behind this. Uh, mm -hmm. Italy is an example. Uh, you don't know too much about what's happening in Russia and China. Uh, Japan is doing some things, but th we know they're doing work there because they show up at the uh, conferences. So, uh, so anyhow, that that report it, it was a technology warning. I said, hey, this this could be a technology surprise. Uh, we should do something about it, and, and that has so far not uh, caused any any excess energy to, to fund what we're doing. Was it 30% excess heat? I thought I heard you say that. That's typically what the uh, the experiments are producing if you're looking at excess heat. And, you know, uh, and clearly that's not enough. You know, I'm a mechanical engineer. I'd like to have a factor of 10 at least because the Carnot cycle takes about, you lose about 30%, and that gives me 70% that I can use to uh, generate the the energy I need to keep the process going and and like my you know like my house or whatever other, other things I want to use it for. Thank you. You know we've uh, we've got a lot of things left to do for the day, but I just want to meet your challenge right now. There are three authors <clears throat> in the in the current proceedings for this conference who already have theories that explain cold fusion. I'll name names. One is Dr. Stoyan Sark, the second is Philip Kanarev from Russia. And the third is, uh, I'm, I'm drawing a blank, but uh, there are, there are, excuse me, but there are, I can, I will be able to find you at least 12 theories in the World Science Database right now that have explanations for cold fusion. And I, you, I, I don't say that they are all necessarily correct, but, but if you're looking for theories, that's the place to look. Yeah. We, we have lots of theories now. That's right. You uh, heard them all. Yeah, we, we, there are lots <laughs> of theories out there, uh, and unfortunately, some of the people, they pick and choose data. They use our data to say their their theory is is correct, uh, when in fact uh, they they pick and choose which of our data they use to make that statement. Uh, so so there are lots of theories, but 
but but, uh, but these are theories I, that are based on fundamental observations and, and physics. They're and going. They're not looking at your data. They're looking at fundamental physics and and perhaps deriving.